now when we have unlimited resources. This is this is a recession. Yeah, the country's in economic downturn, but we're doing PowerPoints from projectors and computers with wireless internet. Okay? Now imagine doing this in a, in a room about not even half the size with desks that are falling apart. It'd be a little bit more difficult. Imagine going to the bathroom and you're not opening up the door that opens up itself and they got the, like, the hand washers, the hand dryer things that are real, real nice. Okay, you're going to the bathroom in our house and you, may, you don't know what animals may be in our house. That's a real recession because there was nothing around. You know, we, we, there, was, there was already, America was still underdeveloped. So imagine being underdeveloped and poor. And that, that, that's pretty difficult. And so when this music came out, all people wanted to do was dance. That's all they cared about. They had the roughest days ever. This is blacks, whites, whatever you want to call it. They had the roughest days in their lives. And they'd go and dance their troubles away in dance hall. And for just a few moments, they would get drunk, dance, and have a good time. And that's what this was all about. And so jazz music sort of started to, to reach its peak. And then it came on the decline around that time because it was considered the beginning of the end. Duke Ellington, one of the most famous jazz musicians, or, or arguably the most famous composer of all time, said, jazz is music, swing is business. Jazz is music, swing is business. What we do is music. What they do is business. What they do is only to make money. So everybody started to sound the same around that time. The connection to rap music, I listen to some popular rap today, and everybody sounds the same. Everybody sounds the same. There are, there are a few people who are mainstream that have a different style and that give respect for that. But if you pay attention to hip hop music in modern day form, I mean, now we're not talking about like the underground hip hop music. We're talking about the popular hip hop music. Okay? A lot of people sound the exact same. They, they sound the same, they wear the same clothes, they talk about the same content. And that was it for jazz. Everybody wanted to be Benny Goodman. Everybody wanted to have, uh, Benny Goodman had a drummer. His name was Gene Krupa. This dude was like the baddest drummer in the land. He would flip his sticks up in the air and, you know, and, and do it behind his back. He would get up and get a kiss from the ladies while he was playing a solo. I mean, the dude was bad, right? So all the drummers started to do that. So you had guys who were as good as them. was like knocking over the drum sets while they were trying to get a kiss and everything. And, and this was all people wanted to see. They wanted entertainment. They didn't want music anymore. And this is where it started to go bad. But the good thing about swing is that it contributed to new, newer forms of music. And if it were not for swing, jazz would not have gone on to fully develop. Because what happened was people started to move away from the swing and started to create newer forms. And these are some of the newer forms that came out of the swing movement. Again, um, I wish I could go deeper into this stuff, but I, I, I really can't. I just don't have the time. But you know, we're skipping over a lot here. But what you're sort of getting is the original framework. Out of swing came cool jazz. Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, cool jazz, and bebop. Um, bebop was sort of, um, bebop was a term that Dizzy Gillespie came up with when he was high. He was high, high off his behind. And he came up with the term bebop because um, he, he started to scat and that sort of, you know, he was like, oh, that will kind of sound like cool music. And bebop, him and Charlie Parker were best friends. They would play together, they would have, they, they would you know, get high together, they would have a good time together. But what happened was, a short story, well, they were like two partners. They were like partners in crime. What happened was Charlie Parker loved drugs so much he started to ruin his life. And Dizzy Gillespie liked drugs, but he didn't like it as much as he liked music. And so what, one day they went out to California, and um, Charlie, the true story, Charlie went to go see Mooch the Mooch, and he never came back. And, you know, this wasn't the first time something like this happened. He would go and just stone and not come back for hours. Charlie Parker died when he was 34 years old. <coughs> 34 years old. I'm 25. When I'm 34, I want to be doing a lot more in my career than what I'm doing now. I don't want to be ending it. And 34 is a very young age to die. And so when he was 34, he was so strung out, he would be in the recording studio, and people would have to hold him up in order to play. Because he, could he, he couldn't even stand. He was strung out, and on top of that, he had stomach ulcers real, real bad. So he was like just killing his body. All right? So they went out to California, and uh, he met up with Mooch to Mooch shortly before they were going to leave and go back to New York. And he never came back. And Dizzy left him. He said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I can't keep taking care of this guy. He used to call him the other half of his heartbeat. And he said, I just can't. I, I can't do it anymore. So he left and went back to New York. They never saw each other again because Charlie died when he was in California. All right? So Charlie died, and Dizzy created Bebop. And Dizzy had a song called Ooh Bop Shabam, which is the title of his presentation. 
And the song was like a, a big hit. It was, you know, it was when standing really started to take its form and everyone wanted to do it. And so you had a lot of people, um, who you, people could really scat, you know, they could really do the, the, the scat thing real good, but some people were just nervous. And it was just like, you know, it became almost as commodified. Scatting was to jazz what I was doing into hip hop. You know, it, it, at that time, like as far as business is concerned, everybody wanted to do it until it just got old. And it was like, all right, now that's corny, stop. You know, you, you got soccer moms doing all the time. It's not fun anymore. Um, and so what, what makes jazz sort of, what, what, what makes jazz sound different is um, a lot of times classical music or like military precision will have everything just one straight beat, quarter notes, okay? Doom, 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 doom. But jazz has this sort of long, short, long, uh, terminology to it. So I mean, instead of going doom, 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 jazz would sound like doom, da doom, da doom, da doom. That was like standard doom, da doom, da doom. So instead of singing ooh, bop, bam, you kind of let it swing a little bit. Ooh, bop, bam. You kind of let it, you kind of let it roll. So you have like long, short, long, short, long, short, and that's how it made it easier to scat. So people scat. If that's what made it sound cool, and all the cool cats like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what happened was in jazz, like cool, cool clubs started popping up all over the place. So the big band started to lose its popularity, and people started building smaller clubs, and they all started dressing alike. So everyone who came to the club would have like a black turtleneck on and a beret and some, you know, some jeans or, or some flats, and you know it was like smoke. Everybody was smoking back then. The Surgeon General was like not paying attention. Everybody was smoking back then. So cool, cool jazz became like the big wave. From cool jazz came post Bop, John Coltrane, favorite musician. John Coltrane was one of the most spiritual jazz musicians. John Coltrane was heavy into drugs. He started his career uh, playing for R&B groups uh, at the time, and he would just like play like the center sack. He'd listen to old black R&B songs that had a lot of uh, low bass in there, you know, because the bass guitar wasn't strong enough back then. And so he would start out playing for these guys, but he kind of got into drugs and he got into jazz. And he really started to play jazz when he played with Miles Davis and his quintet. And he, got to, he, he, he stopped playing, he stopped playing. He locked himself up for almost a year in his attic, locked himself away from his wife, his kids, all that, just locked himself and detoxed himself. No, no rehab, no nothing. He stopped drinking, he stopped, you know, he got off the of drugs, and he, he started to pray. He became a very religious man. When he came out, he released a record called Love Supreme, which I think is the most beautiful composition ever written. It's the, it's the greatest record of all time. Okay, I love Supreme. I have, I have a baby girl on the way. I love Supreme was on my playlist to play when she arrives. I want that to be the first song that she hears. That was his ode to God. That was that was the whole album was written to worship God. And if you read the liner notes, that's the whole thing it wasn't like okay, I like to thank my mom and my cousin. You know. No, the, the liner notes was, a, was was one big prayer. And so the whole song was just one big prayer, and it was designed to praise God while profiling the progression of African Americans. I mean, oh man, it was, it was crazy. If you ever get a chance to listen to a Love Supreme, sit and listen to it. It'll blow your mind. If it doesn't, give it to somebody else. I'm, I guarantee it'll blow there. But he wrote some of the most beautiful compositions when he got off drugs. Art Blakey was a, a jazz drummer. One of, I mean, probably the most famous jazz drummer. He started bands. He started his own band. He pulled Miles Davis to the side and said, hey, why don't you come on and play with me? Miles Davis was just a little known guy, you know, he soon became the most popular jazz musician to ever lived. But he started, you know, playing with, with Blakey. Um, Herbie Hancock also played with Blakey and played with Miles. And so they sort of formed their own style in the post bop era. Modern and free jazz. Um, modern jazz is really what you would hear today, uh, with the exception of smooth jazz, which we'll talk about in a second. Modern jazz is really more of um, uh, today's jazz, where it's a, a little toned down, but they still allow themselves to, to be uh, you know, to employ improvisation as they used to. Uh, but free jazz was like the crazy jazz. There was like no form. And Ornette Coleman, who I don't have here, but he was one of the, uh, one of like the free jazz pioneers. There was like no art form. Like there was no uh, uh, standard form like I talked about before, you know, AAPA. People would just put on the record and all you would hear is <laughs> And like a third of jazz musicians thought it was crap. It was like, this is nobody, you know, who wants to listen to this? That's, but this is what, um, that's jazz music. Now, some people thought this was great. Like, oh, man, did you see what he did? That was awesome. But some people were like, are you serious? Turn this off. And so free jazz um, stayed around for a while, but it really didn't flourish because um, a lot of people didn't really stick around for the development. Smooth jazz is what you hear a lot of today. Smooth jazz is very popular. 
Um, you have some artists like Down to the Bone, Boney James, Kenny G. These are some of the more popular smooth jazz artists. Now, for a long time, I was like anti smooth jazz. I hated it. I didn't care anything about it. The reason I hated it was because they used tracks on there. They, they, they used uh, beat machines instead of drums in a lot of cases. And I was just like, oh, no. No, don't ruin jazz that way. Um, but the more I started to actually sit and listen to it, the more I got into it. And I'm like, okay, maybe I don't like it as much as swing or post bop, but it's, it's still a decent form because they use improvisation. And some of the solos are really good. So, you know, Kenny G, Bonnie James, these are some of the more popular smooth jazz artists. And quite frankly, these are the guys that get work. Nobody goes to hear cool jazz anymore. You know, every now and then you'll have a, a club in Milwaukee, like in Milwaukee, called the Jazz Estate or Caroline's. Those are like two popular jazz clubs in Milwaukee. They play like cool jazz and post box. But nobody goes to hear swing anymore. You can't go to a swing club, you know, in Milwaukee. You're not going to find it. Unless it's like, you know, one of the old novelty clubs where people just dress up, you know, come from the old folks home or something like that. <laughs> but smooth jazz is what you'll hear today. I had a smooth jazz band play at my wedding, they blew the place out. And what, what makes smooth jazz popular is because they play R&B tunes. So they'll play a jazz cover of Al Green's Let's Stay Together. And all the old folks are like, oh! You know how it is when that one record comes on and your, 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 your family member just has to get on the floor even if there's like no dance floor? That's what smooth jazz is. And, and so that gets a lot of radio play. And so these are some of the forms that came out of uh, not only swing, but the earlier jazz movements as well. And this is sort of where we are today. To revisit the connection of black uh, culture, and I'm wrapping up here, um, jazz was our music, our meaning African Americans. And jazz still is our music, but it's not just for us. And it's never just been for us. And I think that was one of the biggest problems um, African American musicians had with uh, the Dixieland Jazz Band, is that we didn't, it's not that we didn't want to share it, but we did want ownership. That's like, you know, me giving you my remote. Yeah, you can share it, you got to leave it back. You can't tell everybody else, oh, this, this, this is my remote. Like, no, that's my remote. <laughs> you can use it, but I want it back eventually. And I think that was the biggest problem with people um, uh, you know, accepting that fact. Um, it told the story of 20, 20th century African Americans. You take a look at the progression of jazz music. You know, it, it went through some similar periods, just as African Americans went through a similar period. You know, finding his voice in America, making that voice heard, getting to a point where we, you know, face difficult problems, declining, having some tremendous, tremendous, tremendous challenges, and then sort of reaching a level, you know, a level of existence. We still have challenges with people, but we still, we're still doing all right. And, and jazz music is the same way. It still has some challenges, but it's still doing okay. Um, and it's considered hip hop's uh, big brother. It, it was the predecessor to hip hop. We talked before about improvisation. We talked before about scatting and freestyling and the similar lifestyles and musicians and lifestyle art form itself. Um, it, it, very, it is very, very similar to the hip hop art form itself. Um, and then I have uh, one more tune to play for you, and we'll, we'll take some questions. It's called A Jazz Thing by uh, Gangstar. Gangstar was um, a popular hip hop a good place to end off at because um, Gangstar was one of the most popular influential groups in hip hop.